point is that you go out of here knowing more than the minute you came in. Okay? There's no shame in not knowing because you're here to learn. All right. And I believe that the, this uh, course this year is going to be recorded again. So for you who want to look at it in the future, that's possible. But I don't know when. So that does not give you, give you an excuse to actually leave thinking that you're going to see it again. Because maybe I'll say no. <laughs> All right. So what is optical coherence tomography? Well, it's a very, very useful exam. Uh, it's a cross-sectional image of the retinal microanatomy that's defined by how light traverses the tissues. So light hits the tissue, comes back, and we see that, you know, in, on a frame. So, and it's applicable really anywhere in the retina, but we mostly use it, you know, in the posterior pole, at the macula, but also at the optic nerve. Uh, but actually, you can do OCT anywhere in the retina. So it's, um, you know, it will give you an, area, an idea about the, uh, um, patholo the pathology, the histology of a tissue. And therefore, it will depict structural changes in the vitreoretinal space uh, or surface, in the intraretinal tissues, in the subretinal tissues, but also uh, in some of the choroidal pathologies, if you go deep enough. Okay, so it's a structural change. It's not a dynamic exam, like fluorescein angiography. It's a structural uh, uh, examination that shows you the anatomy. So it helps establish diagnosis. It helps evaluate clinical course of certain diseases. It monitors treatment. If you're giving a treatment for somebody, let's say, who has cordial neovascularization, doing an OCT before and after injections or a PDT or what forth, will give you an idea if your treatment is effective or not. Okay, the leakage is gone down. The you know the membrane is shrinking and so forth. And it can determine uh, pathogenesis as well, and also uh, uh, determine sometimes uh, like etiology of diseases. So, to not to get you confused, let me give you an outline of how we're going to conduct this. First of all, I'm going to give you a brief, you know, uh, uh, explanation of how does OCT work, and then how do we do an OCT? What what do you do to acquire an OCT? What is the minimum necessary to have a good OCT? And then how to analyze an OCT, both quantitatively but also, uh, you know, qualitatively. And when you analyze it, how do you analyze it and know when you have artifacts so that you don't analyze wrongly. And then we will going to go through the qualitative analysis by looking at some of the diseases, you know, macular diseases. I've kind of categorized things into macular diseases, retinal vascular diseases. Uh, choroidal inflammations, retinal choroidal inflammations, degenerative diseases, and then some tumors, okay? Not everything, because, you know, we have limited time, so I cannot go through everything. But, uh, and in that uh, part of the, uh, I'm going to, like, give you some clinical pictures as well, and fluorescein angiography so that you can tie things together, okay? So that it's not a, just the dry OCT image. Okay, how does OCT work? Now, as I said before, the, it, it depends on light, right? So it's a, it's a test that uh, will use the principle of optical reflectometry, okay? That means you shine light at the retina and the, re and the light comes back, reflects back through a mirror. And the speed of light, uh, the speed at which the, the image reflects back will determine what you see. Okay, and basically the it, you shine light you know across the retina in a series of B scans, and you can do this the old way, which is one B scan at a time. This is what we used to call time domain OCT, or you can do this all at once, like in the spectral domain OCT, and this will give you a sharper image. So. What is the difference? Well, the, in the time domain OCT, you have a slow scanning speed. You cannot get any averaging because every single B scan comes in at a different place, so you cannot really put those images together and get an average image, and you cannot do any eye tracking. Okay, you get an image like this. This is the you know, first generation OCTs. Or you can have a spectral domain OCT in which the, all the B scans are taken at once and the speed is really, really fast, okay? The speed can go up to 70,000 scans per second, all right? So, if, and it can cover a larger area at the same time. So those images can be averaged together and you can get uh, eye tracking and you can get a much clearer image, okay? You have noise reduction. Do you know what averaging means? Removing the noise, removing anything that doesn't repeat itself every time in the same cut, so you get a much clearer, crisper image. Exactly. 
So the benefits of the spectral domain OCT is the speed, of course. The people don't have to stick their head, you know, for a very long time to get to an OCT. Uh, eye tracking, okay, because then uh, since everything goes in very fast, you you know, you, the machine is able to to keep you know the the point of fixation at the same place. Uh, exact registration, which is you know again uh, ties with the uh, with the eye tracking. So. Exact registration is very helpful when you are doing follow-up examination. You do an OCT, and then you, then the machine registers where it took the the image, and then you know next time the patient comes in, you know after treatment or without treatment, the, the machine remembers, you know, based on the uh, landmarks of the of the vessels where where it was the uh, fixation taking place, and the machine will put itself exactly in the same place and will give you another OCT. Um, later on in time, but in exactly the same place, and you can compare. So reproducibility is one of the things that can be done, and of course software analysis. You don't have to analyze everything. The software of the machine analyzes the thicknesses for you. Okay. So important terminologies, and I really, um, I'm, I'm very keen on everybody speaking correctly, speaking correct English, and using the right terminology. Right. You probably know that of me. So resolution is something that you guys should know. Resolution means how fine, how small a structure that you can see. And this will depend on the light source. So the, so the, the new machines you know, use, uh, use a you know, very strong light, uh, light uh, source. The conventional OCT uses any, uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the light shines in the eye, and you can detect structures that are you know, between 8 and 15 microns in size. So it's kind of small. But high resolution OCT, you can detect up to you know, structures that are super small, five to seven microns, okay? Like one red blood cell, right? Ultra high, this is only used in research, you can detect up to one micron, okay? Now, uh, just as an example, as a com for a comparison, a B scan will detect structures that are, are approximately 150 microns. So uh, OCT has a much higher resolution, can detect much smaller things than a B scan. Uh, speed is important. Averaging, we just you know talked about what averaging is. And segmentation. Do you know what segmentation is? Segmentation. When I tell tell you the OCT segmentation is incorrect. Uh, there are lines that are placed by the uh, by, this, by the software. Yes. It should be in the right uh, places, like in the island and in the uh, or the Brooks membrane. Okay. But if it's not placed well, it will get false analysis. That's right. Segmentation is where the machine thinks the boundaries of the tissues are, okay? So the machine will come to put boundaries, uh, like in this case, like your colleague has said, you know, for instance, at the ILM or the Brooks membrane, or, you know, or even I want to segment the nerve fiber layer. So I'm going to put two lines, one on the top of the nerve fiber layer and one at the where I think the bottom of the, of the nerve fiber layer is, and I'm going to assess just the thickness of the nerve fiber layer, for example. That is called segmentation. So if the machine makes a mistake, okay, then you don't have the right correct reading, okay? Then you cannot really use that. You have to actually know where segmentation should take place and look at the scans uh, in order to see whether what the machine is giving you back as, as numbers, as thickness and volume is correct or not, if the, uh, based on whether the segmentation was placed in the right place. And then there's the term reflectivity, okay? So what if we use the term reflectivity because remember I told you that OCT is a, is a study of how La, the light shines and reflects back from tissues. So when, when a tissue is very solid, it's going to reflect a lot, you know, and very fast, and, you know, the, um, the light back. So it's going to have, you know, it's going to be denser, okay? It's going to be more reflective. We're not going to say more fluorescent. We're not going to say more dense. No, we're just going to say higher reflectivity and lower reflectivity. Water and fluid that is very clear is going to have a very low reflectivity. The light is going to go through it, but really, really nothing comes back. There's nothing to reflect from. Okay, this is why it looks dark. Okay, so we don't say bright and bright and light. We say higher reflective, lower reflective. Okay, so uh, this is an example, you know, of what averaging looks like. I think we already talked about it. Notice that in the inferior uh, frame, you have a much um, a crisper image that you can see the details from. Of, uh, the, so we talked about spectral domain. Now, of course, with spectral domain, we can uh, analyze the co the choroid. Uh, if we do an enhanced depth imaging, or we you know there are specific software that do that, but you can also do it by like bringing the machine 
a little bit forward, you know, focusing a little bit deeper into the eye, then you get a, you know, an inverted image that shows you the choroid a little bit better. Sweat source um, OCT um, ha uses um, a wavelength of light that have a deeper pen penetration, you know. Uh, so it shows you not just the retina, but also the choroid and the sclera, and even the vitreous. So it's a very nice, the, the, the sweat source, if you can see down there, it shows you the entire uh, eye wall, you know, with the, the sclera and the, um, uh, the choroid and the, and the vitreous and everything. While in the standard OCT, which is the top one, you really focus just on the retina, and you can see part of the choroid. But if the, in the enhanced depth imaging, which is the middle one, you can see the choroid much better. Okay? And then there's adaptive optic OCT, which is really in research and we don't use that much. Anyway, so the OCT of the macula. How does this work? Well, what, what are the boundaries of the macula that the OCT should distinguish? Well, you have the vitreoretinal interface between the vitreous and the retina. And then you've got the RPE and the Brooks membrane. Uh, we know from anatomy, and if you haven't you know, revise your anatomy, I suggest that you do. Uh, you basically have the Brooks, uh, the RPE that lies on the Brooks membrane, and anything in between is called the retina, okay? And then you've got the choroid, choroid choreo junction, and you can see basically the limit between the choroid, which is a highly vascular tissue, and the sclera, which is really a non-vascular tissue, and that is the choroid. And then you've got the sclera, and if you remember in your anatomy, the sclera is avascular, right? It doesn't have any vessels, so it should be like pretty much homogeneous. And then you've got the vitreous, which is usually clear, unless there is pathology, and therefore it is very hypo, what? <laughs> Beautiful to my ears, music. OCT acquisition. How do we acquire an OCT? Well, you cannot interpret OCT if it's not done properly, because what are you going to interpret? You have to have a norm, right? You have to have a way of doing the, the exam so that the interpreter interprets it. So the minimum that is required usually is uh, basically a line scan, okay, a line through the area of fixation or through the area of interest if you wish, but we're talking about the macula. So we're going to do a line scan through the point of fixation, which is usually the machine passes several times through the same place, and then it produces one image based on the principle of perfect. perfect. So it's a high resolution. So this is the image that will show you the highest resolution of that, of that particular line, okay? And we usually do a horizontal line scan, and we do the same vertically, a vertical line scan. And then we do something which is called a raster scan over, or a volume scan in which the machine takes several cuts, you know, from up to down, usually 19 to 20 cuts from up to down or, you know, from right to left because you can also have, you know, raster scans that are, you know, vertical and to generate a volume analysis. Now, these lines are not going to be as high resolution as the simple line scan because they're not going to pass as many times as the patient sits and the machine, you know, takes several scans up, you know, starting up and going down. And then the software is going to extrapolate thicknesses and what the retina should look like between those two lines, okay? So you have a software-generated image, you know, and a software-generated thickness and volume uh, based on, okay, if the thickness of this line is this, and the thickness of the line you know, under it is this much, then, then probably the thickness in between is going to be you know, somewhere in between, right? So that's, uh, that's how, how it's done. And so it generates cubes, which we're going to talk about in a moment, and those cubes will determine, will be able, you'll be able to detect uh, thicknesses uh, of that specific area and the volume huh, of that specific area. And then if you want, um, now this is uh, optional, you can do also a radial scan. A radial scan meaning that you have you know, clock hours of scanning, okay, instead of horizontal and vertical, you basically scan every clock hour uh, centered on the point of fixation. This is particularly important if you think you, know, you have a macular hole, for instance, you want to know whether it's a full thickness or not, you want to center on one specific area, which you can miss, let's say that the macular hole is in between you know, two lines that are horizontal, you may miss it if it's very, very tiny, but if you do one point you know, on the macula, on the point of fixation, and you take it from every angle, then chances are that you're going to see it at least in one, one or two uh, scans. Okay? So, and then the machine is going to calculate retinal thicknesses by putting those segmentation lines. Okay? So it's going to put an, a segmentation line on the ILM, which is the red line, and it's going to put a segmentation line at the uh, RPE. And where it puts the segmentation line depends on the machines. 
therefore, uh, in, in a Heidelberg machine, in a, uh, uh, which is what we have here at Kekesh, which is like a fantastic machine, the, usually the segmentation is placed at the bottom of the RPE, you know, at the level of the you know, Brooks membrane. Therefore, the thickness is bigger okay, in a Heidelberg machine than if you have a stratus OCT in which the segmentation is usually, the software is, is made to put the segmentation line at the top of the, of the, uh, of the ellipsoid zone, all right? or the cirrus, which is you know, a Zeiss machine, which stops at the RPE uh, complex and that doesn't go as, as down. This is why you cannot compare thicknesses uh, of a macula between different machines. All right, they're going to give you different thicknesses. They can all be normal, but they're going to give you different thicknesses. Okay, so in a Heidelberg, usually we estimate that the central subfield thickness up to 300 is considered normal. All right, okay. So once this machine does that, then it's going to, uh, as I said, it's going to, the software is going to extrapolate uh, the thicknesses in between those lines to give you, you know, an idea of how much the thickness is and you know what the map is. So here we have. Uh, uh, an image in which you know the scan was taken. Let me get this. Yeah. So here we have the scan. You know that was taken. You know a horizontal scan, a, a raster scan, and here is the area of the scan. Okay. So you can, you don't see you don't know anything about the area outside the area of the scan. All right, which is this one, and then you have the the machine is going to uh, uh, you know put over it, uh, an EDTRS type of circle, you know, that delimits fields, central fields, inner fields, you know, superior, temporal, inferior, and nasal, and then outer fields. Um, and it will give you, at each field, what the machine thinks is the, is the right, correct thickness and the volume. Now, the volumes are in uh, millimeter cube, cubic millimeters, and they are in red, and the thickness is three, uh, 272. This means that the central part of this of this scan, okay, has a thickness, an average thickness of 272, which you know we think is normal, and the volume uh, is this much uh, in cubic millimeters. All right, and here are the EDTR subfields. You know, they've got the inner fields, the temporal external, uh, the you know the uh, uh, temporal external, inferior external, and so forth. And then this is the very important one that the studies uh, in uh, research you know, use, which is the central subfield thickness. This is one millimeter, okay? This is from, and this is also another. So here, from here to here, you have basically three millimeters. And if you go from here to here, you have six millimeters, okay? So this is six millimeter wide, and this is one millimeter wide. All right, so, as I said, the OCT therefore can give you uh, quantitative data, central point thickness. Okay, it gives it to you right there. So this is a central subfield thickness of 342 microns, but the central point where the patient is fixating is actually 298 microns. Okay, and it gives you uh, a central subfield thickness, which is what I talked to you about. Uh, I'll give you this one, and then the additional subfields, which we talked about and uh, volumetric analysis. And this is the total volume of, the, of this uh, cubic uh, scan. All right, so coronal thickness and order. Now, how to analyze it? Now, there are two ways of analyzing it. Uh, we usually like to do two things this, you know, at the same time. A quantitative analysis and a qualitative. Now, a quantitative analysis is the one that gives you numbers, which is what, what I just talked about, okay? But it's going to give you quantity. How, it, how much is the thickness? How much is the volume? And therefore, it can be used if you have, if you're doing the patient um, OCT always on the same machine every single time, and you're giving somebody a treatment, uh, and you want to see if the treatment is effective, and the pay, and the machine is able to register exactly where the scan took place, then yes, you can use that to monitor if the thickness is getting less, if it's getting bigger, and so on. And it's definitely used in research, but it's not enough, you know, to um, um, to use that on a daily basis. So basically, you. You see, with the quantitative analysis, you get the numbers, and then the machine helps you by putting colors on areas that it thinks it's not it thinks but were <laughs> uh, colors where you know the the the, uh, the volume and the thickness is more than it's expected, more than normal, uh, with the red being you know thicker, right, and white being thicker, very much thicker, and then green being normal, and then you know yellow being in between, 
and uh, blue being very, very atrophic. So it helps you. Now, if you're using a service machine, one way, the first thing to, to do how to display, this is how it's displayed on a, on a Zeiss service machine. Okay, so the first thing is yeah, that you look at the signal strength, and that is with every machine, you know. You look at the signal, so 7 over 10, it's relatively good. If you have artifacts, if you have cataract, if you have a bad pupil, patient not fixating very well, you're going to have a, a scan that is, has low signal strength, and, you know, maybe the results are not so correct. All right. So always look at the signal strength first, and then you can you see that you have several things. You have an as the SLO image. This is going to give you where the scan took place. Okay. So this is the surface. This is a six by six uh, cube of data, and from this cube of data, it's going to give you the thickness, you know, analysis that we just talked about, and it's going to give you color of the thickness right here you know, with, the fi with basically high reflectivity being red, medium reflectivity being yellow, and then it goes to green, low reflectivity, and then no reflectivity at all, okay? And basically, and then you it will give you two line scans. It'll give you the horizontal scan, and it'll give you the vertical scan. And then if you want a little bit more, it'll, sh it'll also segment the OCT for you, so it'll tell you whether the thickness is due to thickness in the retina, all right, and where the RPE is normal, or whether there's something, maybe the thickness is, you know, not really related to the retina, but related to the RPE or something under pushing the retina. So you, it can differentiate for you, depending on the segmentation, you know, where, where, where is the thickness coming from? Is it from the, under the retina or from the, from the retina itself? Um, yeah, and we'll give you the numbers, of course. Now, in a, in a Heidelberg, which is what we have, basically the display of the results is like this on the machine. It'll give you, first of all, it'll give you the place where the, where the scans took place, okay? So uh, doing the horizontal raster scans, and it'll give you the boundaries of these scans. These are the boundaries, okay? Meaning it's up to here and down to here, but nothing here, okay? So if you have a lesion here, it's not included in the scan. You won't get any, any fresh information from that. And then it will show you an arrow, okay? The arrow. And by convention, by convention, you have here, here It'll give you, for instance, a line. Okay, let me go back. No, oh, let me go back. So, hold on. Yeah, it'll give you a slightly uh, brighter line to tell you which of these lines does this scan correspond to. So, this scan here corresponds to this line. It doesn't correspond to this line, nor the, nor to this line. It corresponds to this line. And here, basically, and there is an arrow, and by convention, the arrow is always on the right. So if you go like this and you don't know where you are, but you see a, a, a line that is like this, okay, and you see this, this one here, all right, then you know that this is on this this uh, particular area, and that this area is nasal, close to the optic nerve, and this area is on this side, okay. Um, and basically, it shows you the segmentation lines. So this is important that you look at it because you want to make sure that the machine put the segmentation lines in the correct place, all right? And if everything is correct, then the machine is going to show you the thicknesses of the different parts. And here you have a little bit of thickness temporally, and it shows right here that you have thickness temporally, okay? So it'll give you all the thicknesses that you need. There we go. And this is the arrow tail and the arrow head. Okay, and then here you have the numbers if you need the numbers, and you've got the subfield thicknesses and the color-coded EDTRS map, whatever you want. So, the quantitative, um, quantitative uh, OCT interpretation will, of course, then depend on the correct acquisition technique and segmentation, and, of course, this is where you can have artifacts, and this is where you can get wrong numbers if you're not, not paying attention. What are the artifacts? One of them is software breakdown, that is inaccurate segmentation, Misalignment, blink artifacts, motion of the eyes artifact, mirror artifact, out of range artifact, and shadowing artifacts, and then reflection. Let's look at software breakdown. Okay, here you have a patient that was one of our patients in which the machine mistakenly put the segmentation line along this epiretinal, you know, this hyaloid. Right? There's a fibrous membrane here, and then the hyaluron is elevated. So instead of putting the segmentation correctly here, it, it made a wrong mistake. It made a mistake, actually, and then it even made a mistake inferiorly. So then it generates a map for you. And if you look at it, you say, oh, wow, this is really, really thick here. 
But it's actually not thick at all. This is wrong. The thick segmentation is wrong. And therefore, the thickness of the retina is wrong. This is rubbish. So you should know that you cannot count on this. Forget it, OK? So yeah, so wrong map. Now, here's again another example. Uh, we have outer retinal misidentification. Here, the, the segmentation was placed correctly at the inner, at the ILM, okay, the inner limiting membrane, but the segmentation was placed completely irregularly, you know, and in the choroid instead of, instead of being on the RPE Brooks membrane, and you have the machine didn't know what it, what it, what it was supposed to be. This was supposed to be the, the proper place, and here, this is supposed to be the proper place. So you don't have the proper machine, the proper numbers, okay? You cannot count on the numbers unless you see that every single line was segmented correctly, okay? How do you do this? Well, you can manually, if you, are, if you know how, uh, we can do that here actually, even in the clinic, you can manually correct the segmentation one by one. It takes, it takes time, but then you can get a proper number. And now the newer machines are able to actually do that for you, okay? Now you can also have out of center misalignment, okay? Patient is not fixing properly, and then you have an OCT that was not perfectly centered, okay? This is where the fovea is. This is where the centration should be. So the center should have been here and not here. And if you have the center, you know, misplaced, then you will have a wrong number because now this, instead of having a central subfield thickness that takes takes into consideration the foveal depression, which is thin, it's actually taking into consideration the parafoveal area, which is thicker. So now you have a thicker, thicker, you know, central subfield, which shouldn't be, right? So this way you can also correct it, you know, clinically. Uh, blink artifacts. Blink artifacts, a lot of, you know, you cannot really correct blink artifacts. The patient has blinked. What do you want to do? But this is how you recognize them when you have these lines, okay? These shadows and these lines, either, either you know, in which the machine made a very wrong segmentation because the patient blinked, and then it shows you as a, you know, a very big thickness, or it shows you as, rather, as, you know, as a, you know, hyperreflective area. So, Motion thickness, every time that you have also these, you know, lines, let me show you, yeah, if you have these, you know, horizontal lines, this is motion thickness, okay? Same thing, so you have irregular maps. Mirror artifact, you see this when every time that you have a lesion protruding in, in the retina, protruding towards the vitreous, or if you have a lesion, you know, or a place in the retina that actually goes back up, outwards towards, towards the sclera, like people, for instance, with myopia. Okay, where they have a posterior staphyloma, their, their eye wall is not regular, so the the machine catches uh, catches you know this this irregularity because it's unable to focus both both on the place where you want to focus and also on the posterior or the anterior you know place, um, and uh, therefore you can get these mirror artifacts. The the reason why you have mirror artifacts occur is because every every machine every OCT machine actually gives you a real image and a mirror image, like, like we see here, okay? So, and this is the plane of focus. So if you have somebody who has, uh, what it does then is that it eliminates one of those, you know, uh, it truncates, it eliminates this machine and you're only seeing this one. But if the patient is, uh, the operator focuses on one area and an eye that has irregularity, it's going to, you know, pick up a little bit of the, of the other area. Okay, in a, as a, in a mirror fashion, okay, and so basically you can get you know images like this here. For instance, the choroid here uh, is actually the mirror of this. All right, so you recognize mirror artifacts here again. You have mirror or inversion artifacts because a patient has myopia. Here, this is a patient who has a tumor. Okay, and uh, the, therefore the, everything is going upwards like this, and you have a mirror image of the retina here. So this is wrong. Okay, so if you have a if you rescan with focusing on the elevated retina instead of the macula, then all of a sudden now you have a scan where the tumor is protruding, but you have a clearer scan of the retina. So you need to know all this. Out of range uh, error is, uh, well, well, sometimes you get OCTs that look like this. Well, you can't really get any maps out of this because you don't have, you don't have the, the rest of the image to calculate the maps. And you can see that the, the map has you know, zero uh, numbers here because it doesn't, the machine doesn't know what to do, right? So you have missing data, okay? And uh, you, in this, you just have to rescan the patient. And finally, the low signal uh, strength because uh, of floaters or media opacities. If you have cataract, if you have a polydilated pupil, uh, if you have vitreous hemorrhage, you're not going to get proper 
uh, proper images, and you, then you'll have um, uh, basically um, you know wrong wrong numbers as well, and the machine may not know where to put the segmentation. Uh, a floater, you can always recognize a floater here is an example, you know, where you have a floater that, in which you have an attenuation of the reflectivity throughout the entire scan, okay? Notice how here you have uh, attenuation of the reflectivity, but it also is uh, duplicated here and here, so you know that there is something up here that is ca casting a shadow, okay? And here it is, here is an image, here is the left eye, you know, of this patient, this is the left eye, there, you've got the floater, it's casting a shadow, but then you scan the right eye and you have, okay, um, um, actually this was not a floater, this was a, a, this was a, a dust on the machine, okay? So yeah, so you scan, but it's kind of the same thing. Um, you here you have, um, you know, an artifact on the lens of the machine, all right? And you have the same place, it's in the same place, and you get this machine. But if you do have a vitreous floater, this is what exactly is going gonna, gonna to give you the same thing. Now, um, Basically, yeah, and therefore, and then, then, so we do use the quantitative. In fact, we like to take a look at the map. However, what we use in the clinical setting, for patient to patient, we always like to look at the structure of the OCT because that gives much more information, not just the thickness, but what's happening inside, right? So it depicts the changes in pathology and the changes in pathology over time and it aids in the treatment decision, and of course it's very helpful for patients when you show them, okay, this is somebody with macular edema, for instance, you say, okay, this is what you looked like before, now I've given you, you know, diabetes control and injections, and you know, you look much better, the thinness, the thickness is decreasing, that the patients can grasp this concept of getting better. How do we analyze quantitatively, or qualitatively? Well, we have to remember, you know, what the retina looks like, okay, anatomy, anatomy, Anatomy. Yeah, Hasra. Okay. Anatomy. All right. Bismillah. Inner retina. Inner retina is is uh, uh, provided for vascular. You know, uh, the the nourishment is provided for by the by the retinal vessels, right? And the then you've got the outer retina, which is made of what? Outer retina. Okay, one by one. Let's start from where? Let's start from OPL. Okay, outer plexiform. Okay, what is the outer plexiform? But that's but basically, so the outer retina is made of. You said OPL. Fine, I'll take that. And so, what else? Is the OPL the most inner part of the outer, of the uh, outer retina, or the or the most outer part? The most inner. So what comes outer? Outer nuclear. Hello, my name. Inner segment. Okay, the the inner segment, and then. And then. Clever. Outer segment. What name? Well, the inner segment, outer segment is where the easy is. Okay. The interdigitation zone, yes, the interdigitation zone of the of the, the those four receptors, outer segments, and the and the RPE. And the RPE and Brooks. Okay, so that's the outer retina. Well, inner retina is you know what's mo most inner to that. Okay, so the inner retina. The inner retina, just remember one thing if you ever get lost, is that the nuclear layers are hypo-reflective, okay? So they're going to appear darker, all right? So you have a nerve fiber layer, the fiber layers, which is the outer plexiform, inner plexiform, knife fiber layer, all these are fiber layers, okay? These are fibers, okay, connecting with each other. So the, the fiber layers are hyper-reflective. So, very easy, the nerve fiber layer is, on, you know, is the most internal part of the inner retina, and therefore it is you know, hyper-reflective, bright, all right, and there it is. And then you've got the ganglion cell layer, which is hypo-reflective, because it's made of the nuclei of the ganglion cells, so it is right there. And then you've got the inner plexiform layer, which is, you know, connects the molar cells, the uh, ganglion cells, the bipolar cells, axons, okay, the amacrine cells, uh, all of these things, uh, you know, connect in the inner plexiform layer, and it's hyper-reflective, again. And then the inner nuclear layer, which is made of what? Bipolar. Bipolar? Bipolar? 
بس كده ايش هو كمان اماكرين اوكي هوريزونتال مولر So you've got the molar cells, the bipolar cells, the amacrine cells, and the horizontal cells. Correct. Yeah, that's the inner nuclear. Right. Very good. And the inner nuclear is going to be hyporeflective. And then you've got the, the OPL, which is actually the inner part of the OPL, which is the outer plexiform layer. And it is this part of the outer plexiform layer, the inner part here, right there, okay, is, the, um, is in the inner retina. Now, the outer retina is made out of the outer nuclear layer, which is right there, okay, hyporeflective, and these are the axons, so part of it, part of it is uh, hidden sometimes in the OCT, you cannot see it very clearly, but that's the, that's the nerve fiber layer of Henley, okay. Now, the external limiting membrane, all right, right there, okay, it's hyperreflective, very fine hairline structure, the ellipsoid zone, right, which is hyperreflective, which is where the mitochondria of the photoreceptors are. And then you've got the interdigitation zone, which is the top part of the RPE, where it interdigitates with the uh, photoreceptor uh, outer segments, right there. And then you've got the RPE, Brooks membrane complex, which is the bottom part of the RPE, which is hyperreflective, very hyperreflective, right there. Okay, so if we look at this in a little bit more detail, because this is, these lines are very important, sometimes difficult for you to, to get. This is the basically the external limiting membrane, right? Okay, and this is where the Golgi apparatus are, okay, in the inner segment. This is the photoreceptor, you know, outer segment. Photoreceptor, um, you know, structure, the photoreceptors, we call it the photoreceptor layer. This is the ellipsoid zone where the mitochondria are, okay? And then here is the where the discs are. This is the interdigitation zone. And then you've got the Brooks membrane. And here we go again. And if you go in the choroid, then you have the chorio capillaries, which is a very fine, dark, hyporeflective line, which you don't see unless you know, you've got elevation of the RPE. If you've got a PED, then you can see the Brooks membrane and possibly the chorio capillaries. But you've got a very hyperreflective material, which is the Brooks membrane, sitting right on top of the chorio capillaries. Therefore, it's very difficult to see the chorio capillaries. But remember, that's, that's where they are. And then you've got the middle choroidal vessels, uh, which are the saffron layer, and the hyalur vessels, which are the bigger, you know, large choroidal vessels. And at the end, you've got the choriosclerotal junction. Okay, so what are the OCT reading rules? Well, first of all, you have to know the anatomy. You have to know the anatomy to see what's abnormal, right? And uh, basically, you know the anatomy, and now you know, after we've reviewed them together, you know the reflectivity of each structure, okay? So now, if, if the reflectivity of the outer nuclear layer is not the same as you expect, then that's abnormal, right? Okay, so what are the normally hyperreflective structures? Just to repeat one more time, it's the vitreo retinal uh, interface, which is the ILM, okay, the nerve fiber layer, the, R sorry, the RPE, very, very hyperreflective. Any scar, okay, any fibrotic tissue, uh, lipid, blood, pigment, okay, and all this is, is hyperreflective. And Hyperreflective will be any tissue that is behind a tissue that has lost this reflectivity. Because it, the tissue, like for instance, if you have curtain. a curtain mm -hmm. and you have a hole in the curtain, okay, the light is going to go much, much more through the hole in the curtain and the, the area behind the curtain is going to be brighter than the area behind the curtain elsewhere. Okay, so that's hyperreflective. Now, moderate reflectivity, uh, usually vitreous membranes, plexiform layers, and ellipsoid zone. Lower reflectivity, if you have you know, vitreous debris, the retinal nuclear layers have lower reflectivity, and very low reflectivity, almost no reflectivity, is if you have clear vitreous, clear subretinal fluid, okay, silicon oil, shadowing, all that is low reflective, okay? So, remember one thing, is that the ILM on top of a nerve fiber layer is not depicted unless it's very thick, okay? Again, the Brooks membrane and the chorio capillaries can really not be, can not be seen very, very well if the RPE is sitting on top of them because the RPE is so reflective that you don't see them, okay? The, there, this is a normal elevation under the fovea. It's called the uh, clevis inversus, okay? And the, this Henley fiber layer, which is the outer part 
of the outer plexiform layer is going to, the reflectivity will depend on the incidence of the OCT. So if you have an OCT that is taken, you know, immediately, you know, head on, you're going to have the reflectivity being the same on the same, you know, on either side of the phobia, for instance. But if the OCT is tilted, a little bit of the eye is tilted, then you're going to have a reflectivity that is different on one side than the other, okay? So it depends on the incidence of the OCT. And any change in the reflectivity that you know now is going to be considered, you know, abnormal, okay? Right. So, again, OCT reading rules is that you have the presence, if you have blood, pigment, lipid, scar, floater, that's going to give you shadowing, okay? Shadowing, because it's light. Right? You're, you're, hitting, you're putting a light on a tissue and you're trying to see what reflects back. And if you, the, if, you know, the, 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 there's a, you know, a, a lesion or an, a structure that reflects back the light at you, doesn't let you see the behind, and it behind is going to be just you know, dark. Right? So it's going to give you shadowing. These are vessels of the retina, okay? and they're shadowing. You can see that the shadowing goes all the way through. All right? This is a vessel also oriented horizontally. Right? And you see the shadowing. This is an area, you know, this guy uh, has lipid in the macula, and they've got lipid deposit in the outer plexiform layer, and it shadows posteriorly. So you've got shadowing. And if you have, on the other hand, absence of tissue, then you will produce, this will produce an underlying hyperreflectivity, which is what we call, you know, inverse shadowing. Like if you have laser scars or if you have geographic atrophy, then you have laser scars. So orientation. Which side is nasal? Right. right. And how do you know that? Thicker. What is thicker? The nerve, nerve fiber layer is thicker. Exactly. The nerve fiber layer is thicker. You guys are great. I think I should go home. <laughs> so, okay. And what about here? Where is the head of the arrow on the OCT scan? Right. It's right. So where is it? Anatomically. Infrotemporal. Infrotemporal. Exactly. So if you have this, so you know that this is infrotemporal, this is nasal, supranasal, and this is infrotemporal, okay? This is basal arrow, head of the arrow, infrotemporal, and supratemporal. Okay, which side is nasal? Those who have seen this slide before have said the answer. Okay, all right. I, I think next time I'm going to use a different slide. All right. <laughs> it's a vertical cut, okay? And which, which is top is the bottom? Ha! Ha! I got you. Okay. Which is top and which is bottom? The top is on the right because the side, the, by convention, the head of the arrow is always on the right. So this is top and this is bottom. Okay. It's a vertical scan. Okay. So you're right. Okay. Good. So what are these? We already see, saw these. So these are retinal vessels that are casting shadows. Okay. There should be no. Confusion and what are these? Blood vessels. Come on, yes, these are blood vessels, and you know, basically you have a you have a vitreous detachment, but I'm I'm fooling you, okay? Because basically you have shadows from these vessels. You see how this is kind of large. The reason it's large is because the line is going through the entire, you know, uh, you know, through the vessel horizontally. While here the the line is cutting the vessel, you know, on a, in a pinpoint, you know, way. All right. So what are these? I showed you this before. Blood vessels. Again, the same phenomenon. You see, the line happened to cross the go across the retin the retinal vessel, so it gives you a horizontal, uh, you know, hyperreflective area with shadowing. And what are these? Choroidal vessels. These are choroidal vessels. Yes, hyperreflective choroidal vessels. And how is the choroid? Thin. It's very thin. This is a patient who has age-related choroidal atrophy. Okay, so the choroid is very thin, look at it, look how thin. The choroid is just there because this is avascular. So this is sclera, so this is a patient that is really, really like, you know, age-related choroid atrophy, everything is atrophied. So, you know, patients can have, you know, pale optic discs and low perfusion and they don't see very well in the dark and all that because they don't have a, you know, good perfusion of the choroid as, you know, as they as compared to when they were young. So yeah, so this layer is the sclera and the choroid is thin, okay. And what is this? Reverse yeah, reverse shadowing because of many areas of, you know, atrophy, outer retinal atrophy. What, are, what is this? PED. PED, what do we call it when it's tiny? Drusen. Drusen. 
we call a drusen. So this is a drusen, and this is a drus, okay? So drus, drus, multiples are drusen, all right? So these are drusen. And what is this? Brooks. This is the Brooks membrane. See, when the RPE is elevated, you can see the Brooks membrane. All right. And what is this? These are above the RPE. Pseudodrusen, exactly. Drusen, yeah, pseudodrusen, or subretinal drusenoid deposits, okay, above the RPE. And what is this? Easy. You can see that the, the, the you know, RPE is very hyperreflective, and you can see that the EZ is going up and down again, and you have a hyperreflective cavity, so this is fluid, uh, clear fluid. Okay, what's this? PED or a Druze, okay, Druze again, and what is here? What's happening here? What is that? What is this? What is this line? RPE, RPE. and what's happening with the RPE? It becomes elevated, okay, it becomes elevated, and now you see the cori capillaries. See that? The line? Right. So you have an elevated corrugated RPE, which you see in AMD, you see in polyportal vasculopathy, you see in CSCR sometimes as well. And then you see this black line, this or hyporeflective line, is the cori capillaries. And the hyperreflective line just above it, okay, is the Brooks membrane. Right. So basically. And what's this here? Progressive shadowing. You have progressive shadowing. The reason you have progressive shadowing is because you've got stuff there. You've got stuff under the retina, okay? And most likely this this one you have progressive shadowing is blood. And here it is. And you can see it clearly on the on the pictures. Okay? And you have gradual shadowing. What is this? <laughs> hmm? <laughs> yeah, this is the posterior Yeah. Posterior And what's this? Yeah? Where is Shecha? Bursa. There she is. Yeah. So you have the premacular bursa, which is the, you know, the, uh, uh, the fluid, the clear fluid that's in the pockets right in front of the macula before the vitreous detaches completely. Okay, so basically here is the vitreous. It goes up like this and up like this, and you have this bag of fluid. And the minute this fluid goes through, through the posterior hyaloid, it's going to lift the vitreous up. Okay, you have here also thinning, right, compared to here. Which side is nasal? Right. Left. Decide. Left. This or this? Left. One, two. One. One. Okay, nasal is here because you have a, you know, the uh, ILM is thicker, you know, nasally. But here you don't have a normal retina, right? You know that it's thin, probably thin because of a vascular insult. All right, so uh, now we're going to look at cases. And um, therefore, what we are going to need is the qualitative uh, view uh, of the cases, not the uh, measurements uh, based on quantitative review. So how do we interpret OCT? And how do you interpret any imaging technique? Okay? We definitely um, we need to know that, of course, all techniques are going to depend on the media clarity. And I've spent a long time right now, the first hour, discussing the normal pattern. Because if you, you cannot distinguish what is abnormal if you don't know the normal. So any deviation from normal is going to be abnormal, right? And always use a systematic approach. And I do this when I, when I ask you to look at the fluorescein and geography. For those who look at the, our you know, retinal imaging conferences, you, know, you just don't, don't look at the picture figure as a whole and just decide, okay, this is abnormal. No, you have to look at, you know, train your eye, train your thoughts about looking about different layers, different zones, different structures, so that you can come up with a diagnosis. And as with all imaging techniques, the best thing to do is always to correlate what does the uh, certain image look on, con on fundus photo, what does it, how does it look on other imaging if you have. So when you have a correlation of images, you get up, you know, you are able to make a better diagnosis and better assessment. So review of cases. Usually my course used to be, um, I'll start with the vitreous and then the retinal interface, intraretinal pathologies, you know, outer retinal pathologies, uh, subretinal pathologies, choroidal pathology, and so forth. This, this year I decided to change that a little bit and to put more clinical cases so that we uh, look at uh, diseases, instead of looking at structures from, up, you know, from inner to outer, we're going to look at, you know, different diseases and different uh, pathologies and how they present primarily on OCT but also a little bit on the other images. Okay, so we're going to start with macular diseases. What defines macular diseases 
Come on, any disease can, can influence the macula, right? But when we talk about macular diseases, we basically are talking about uh, diseases that have either a lot of fluid or that have vessels or that have subretinal or retinal deposits, uh, atrophic changes, and so forth. Okay, so it's a very big variety. The first one we'll discuss is central serous cordial retinopathy, which all of you know. Okay, what well, it's um, you know the uh, pathology where you have subretinal fluid, but also sometimes sub RPE fluid, right? So here is a case in which there is um, a, a, a CSCR. Let me get this. CSCR. So uh, you'll see it on a, clinically; it will look like a bleb. And if you do, a, you know, an autofluorescence, you're going to see hyperautofluorescence at the level of the bleb, right? And if you do a, an OCT and you take this line, okay, this line right here corresponds to this OCT image right here. And what you see is elevated photoreceptors and subretinal fluid. How do you know it's subretinal, not sub-RPE? Well, because you can see that the RPE is continuous and it's a very hyperreflective layer. And what's elevated is, you know, from the ellipsoid zone. The ellipsoid zone is, you know, stuck here and then all of a sudden it detaches and then comes down again. And you can see these elongated photoreceptor outer, outer segments, sometimes we call them shaggy photoreceptors. That's because the discs get stuck to the outer uh, segments uh, uh, processes and they are not um, able to be phagocytos very easily with the, with the, for, with the, you know, from the RPE. If you do a fluorescein angiography, you will see a hot spot, okay, uh, leaking hyperfluorescent spot, which in the later um, phrase, fames, uh, phases of the angiogram can give you either a small stack appearance leakage or a, an ink blot. Regardless, basically what you see here is leakage and this leakage is causing fluid, and the fluid is manifested very easily on the OCT. So you, here you see the structural change, and here you see the dynamic change. Here you see the, what, what is causing this change, but here you see the structural change. All right. Now, OCT is very nice because it can tell you exactly, you know, where does the fluid stop and where does it, you know, start. So here, for instance, you have um, CSCR. You may not be able to, you know, see it very clearly, but you have a subretinal bleb. You have um, a leaking spot on a fluorescein angiography, and if you do two cuts, you know, through this eye, through this macula, one is a horizontal cut, okay, and you see this thing. So where is the fovea? Where is the um, fluid? Yeah, it is subretinal, of course, but hmm? it's almost subfovea because you can see the fovea depression right there, and you can see the ellipsoid zone is elevated, and this is subfovea. But you think this is a small bleb, right? You say, oh my God, this is very tiny. But if you look at the at the radial cut, okay, you have a radial cut that goes from up to down, you are going to see much more fluid in this area. And this, where, where is this? Is this up or down? Why? Yeah, I know, but why? The arrow, uh, the arrow is by default, it's always pointed to the right. Exactly. So if we had an arrow here, it will be pointing to the right, okay? But we know from here we don't have an arrow on this representation. But if we did have an arrow, it will be the arrow will be here. This is inferotemporal, and this is supranasal, and we can tell that it's supranasal by the by the nerve fiber layer. Okay, what is this? Hmm? This is a pigment epithelial detachment. So it's a serous pigment epithelial detachment. Exactly. So we can see that the it's the the big hyperreflective, big thick line that is elevated, and not the neurosensory retina. And a PED will look something like this. You know, it will have you know, early hyperfluorescence, and then the hyperfluorescence increases, and it increases in intensity, but does not spread in sizes. That's because the junctions between the RPE, you know, and the cori capillaries are very strong via the Brooks membrane. The Brooks membrane does not let, those junctions does not let the, uh, you know, the fluid dissect and, and, and spread, you know, out uh, very easily. So it's kind of a very sequestrated, very compact uh, area. All right, so here you have this PED. There it is. You may not be able to see it very clearly, but it's right there. Okay, I highlighted it for you. So pigment epithelial detachment is part of CSCR, as you know. Okay, now CSCR can also, you know, be associated with, you know, a lot of fluid that goes, you know, tracks down inferiorly through gravitational forces. Here's an area, you know, where you have possibly a PED, right? PED with leakage. This is, this is the line. Okay, this is basically where is up and where is down. Where's the arrow here? The arrow is right there. See, I don't know if you guys can see it, but the arrow is right there. See how this is thicker compared to here? This is the arrow head, right? So, am I, um, no, I'm fooling you. No. Ha, ha, ha. 
Um, so yeah, yeah, no, it's a vertical scan. So which is which is top and which is bottom? Sounds if I had an arrow here, will this be correct? Will this be correct? No, this is horizontal cut. This is? No, it's a vertical cut. It's a vertical cut, okay? And it shows you the pigment epithelial attachment and it shows you the fluid, right? Yeah. Okay. So, where, where, is this up or down? Down. Down. Why do you say down? Good. If the arrow is here, then it will be here. And then this will be up. That's the PED. Okay? Can you see? Can you raise it? Can we do it again? The arrow always, by convention, is on the right. So if I show you this with the arrow here, that means this is the this is top, and this is bottom. This is top, and this is bottom. Okay? All right. So. So it's RPE changes with, with tracks. Okay, another pathology in the macula is what we know is the choroidal vascularization, and you know that there are at least three types and with the additional polypoidal vasculopathy. So a type one membrane is choroidal, you know, vessels going through the RP, you know, through the uh, cori capillaries here and through the Brooks membrane, but stopping under the RPE, that's a type one membrane, which is what we call an occult membrane or a fibrovascular PED, fibrovascular PED, okay? Or you have a classic membrane in which the membrane starts as a fibrovascular PED but grows through the RPE and settles under the retina. That is a type 2, classic membrane. And then you have a type 3 membrane, which is called the retinal angiomatous proliferation, in which you have vessels from the retina that make their way down towards the RPE, and then vessels in the choroid that make their way up throughout the RPE, and they start to connect, okay? And the, this is called the fibrovascular uh, retinal angiomatous proliferation, or type 3 macular neovascularization. And then you've got PCV, polypoidal vasculopathy, in which the membranes are under the RPE, so exactly like a type 1 membrane, but they have these, you know, polyps. They have these, you know, balloons at the end uh, that, you know, they're called, you know, polypoidal. Now, a, uh, membranes on the fluorescein angiography will, you know, you know, look like they have, you know, hyperfluorescence, and you may have hypofluorescence corresponding to blood or to pigment, you know, pigment epithelial changes, a pigmentation uh, that causes, uh, you know, this hypofluorescence. And then if you go throughout the angiogram in the late phases, you have leakage. So early hyperfluorescence, late leakage, but definitely early hyperfluorescence is a classic choroidal neovascular membrane, classic, okay? This is a type 2 membrane that goes through the RPE, all right? And here, this is a patient that has drusen, and of course, the, these drusen are pinpoint, you know, fluorescence, pinpoint to hyperfluorescence, so that don't leak. But here's here's that membrane, okay? And here's that blood, and this is this, this you know, hyper-elevated, uh, you know, RPE uh, um, hyperplasia that is along the membrane. So how does this look on an OCT? Well, what did we say about the membrane? It goes through the RPE. It goes through the RPE. So yeah. So here, if you look through the RPE, you want to see that there is something going through the RPE, right? Through the RPE and settling. Okay. And this is you've got the retina. Easy. Okay. You've got the ellipsoid zone right there. You follow it. You follow it. The best way is to try to follow. Okay. You've got the follow here, the external limiting membrane, and here the ellipsoid zone, and the ellipsoid zone is disrupted, and you've got something that goes between the RPE and the neurosensory retina. It has gone across the RPE. This is a top type 2 membrane. So you have the elevated ellipsoid zone, you have clear subretinal fluid, and you have an undetached RPE. And it, this is the membrane is this one, is this hyperreflective structure, okay? That is the CNV. Here's another case. Here's one of my patients that I've been following for years. Basically, he had uh, a tiny area right there. Here it is, this one, early and late fluorescein angiogram, early hyperfluorescence that was detectable, and then later on there was leakage. This is the you know uh, expanded image of it, and I did an OCT and I said, oh my God, there's some leakage here. Let me see what's going on, and I do an OCT, and this area here is actually, you know, he's got a lot of drusen. This is a very high risk, pay, you know, high risk for AMD patient. A lot of drusen. No, they're drusen. No, no, this no, is no. RPE. Okay, so mm, this one here. This is a drusen. This is an RPE elevation. This is the Brooks membrane, and then there is subretinal fluid. 
So there's suffering with fluid. Yeah, there is leakage. So at this point, I said, uh-huh, no, this is a membrane. It's very tiny. It's still very, very early. We started him on treatment, started him on the treatment, and uh, he continues to have medications, you know. He comes regularly to the clinics to get his injections because he already had lost his eye, the, I mean, lost a lot of vision in the other eye. So yeah, these are the drusen, and this is fuzzy. When you, so we have a drusen here that's really well, very well demarcated, but then here it's fuzzy. So when you see this fuzziness, you know, you have to suspect a CNV. You, it doesn't have to always be clear subretinal fluid. Sometimes it's hyperreflective fluid, but this doesn't look normal. You really cannot trace. Here you can actually draw the drusen with a pencil, right? Yeah. But here you cannot. Okay. So, yes? For this one, why didn't we say it's an occult? The RPE looks intact. This is the RP. This is the RP. Okay. In the area of the CNV. In the uh, yeah, the, the, it uh, here, the you don't see you, no, you see you don't see very clearly. You, you see fuzziness on top of the RPE and almost growing into the inner nuclear, the outer nuclear layer. See this? Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. So now uh, you can. This is a patient with myopia, high myopia. Okay, this is you know an area of corneal atrophy, and then you've got the um, uh, you know the hyperreflective, uh, hyperfluorescent uh, lesion. And if you do an OCT through this area, okay, you can see that there is a you know hyperreflective lesion under the fovea. And you do the same, you know, you do a radial air, a radial scan. You can see that there is myopic changes with the with the, with the choroid being very thin. Okay, and then you've got something on top of the RPE, right? But it's compact. It's hyperreflective. It tends to be smaller and more compact. So these are classic choroidal neovascular membranes in myopia. Okay, what about occult membranes? You know, type one membranes. Here's another patient who has an occult membrane. We do a, you know, there's here you can see the membrane. You can see the hyperpigmentation associated with it, the exudation that's associated with it. You do a, you know, a line scan, and this line scan actually is going through here. And what do you see? You see basically the pigment epithelium is elevated, right? It looks elevated. And this is a drusen. Here's a drusen. This is clear subretinal fluid between the, the intact pigment epithelium right here, here with subretinal fluid between the retina and the RPE. But then here, you know, you see, you know, fuzziness, but this is the hyperreflective membrane right there. Okay? And then you've got on top of that, you have hyperreflective me membrane, which you have reflective fluid, which you call shrimp, subretinal hyperreflective material. You also have clear fluid, and you have also intraretinal fluid. So this is how an, uh, uh, an occult membrane looks. Here again, you know, here's another patient, or, or maybe, it's a, maybe it's the same, I don't remember. But here's the Brooks membrane, okay? And you can see that the RPE is elevated and then hyper-reflective under this RPE elevation. There's also an area of geographic atrophy reverse. With, with reverse shadowing. There's also inner intraretinal fluid, okay? And here, basically, you have shadowing from the hyper-reflective material right there. So, but the RPE is elevated, okay? And hyper-reflective, not like a serous PED like we saw in CSR, which was clear, mm -hmm. all right? Here's an, a patient with, I think, some myopia because of the perimacular, uh, peri-optic nerve had, uh, pa, you know, uh, atrophic changes. But there are also like atrophy in the in the retina itself and possibly some drusen. And if you look uh, carefully, this is a late fluorescein angiogram. You see the staining of the peripapillary atrophy, but you see staining also of all this area, especially this area of atrophy. And when you do a fluorescein um, OCT, you're going to see that this corrugated RPE. You see this? So this is the Brooks membrane, and then here you've got drusen. See that? You've got drusen, and then as you go through the membrane, you can see that it gets, it gets much more ugly, right? So now the RPE is more elevated. It, there is hyperreflective stuff under it. There is subretinal fluid, but there's also inner retinal fluid. And it gets uglier, where, you know, here you have a big elevation of the retinal pigment epithelium from the Brooks membrane, and you have a lot of intraretinal fluid. And then you, as you go down, you can see that the, the RPE is slightly elevated above the Brooks membrane, but here it's really hyper-elevated and kind of multi-laminated with you know, episodes of leakage and fibrosis and leakage and fibrosis and leakage and fibrosis. So it gets this hyper-reflective scar that you get. 
Okay, and then here you have subretinal fluid and intraretinal fluid. And the same thing, you know, happens here, right? So, yeah, this is how uh, the, uh, as you go down, you can see the same thing, hyperreflective, multilaminated, you know, subretinal material under the, hyper, high, the elevated RPE, subretinal fluid, and intraretinal fluid. So this is a, a type 1, which we would call an occult CMV. Now, the third type, um, I, I don't think I have wraps. Maybe I forgot to put a wrap, but never mind. Uh, the fourth type is the polypoidal vasculopathy, okay? Uh, in which is, is a, a type of uh, choroidal neovascular membrane uh, that is under the RPE, but which has sacular, sacular dilatations. You can see this very clearly on an ICG. You can see, you know, very nicely an ICG how the sacs uh, look. And they uh, often, it's like, you know, a bunch of grapes, you know, where you have the grape stems, what we call the branching vascular network, and at the end of the branching vascular network, you have the polyps. And uh, actually, you can see that very clearly, very nicely on an OCT. On an OCT, the polyp is always un at the under surface of the RPE. Okay, here it is, here it is, here's a polyp, and there's another one, and here's another one. And then you've got subretinal fluid, and in some cases, you have a branch, you can see actually the branch, branching retinal uh, vascular network, which, which is the RPE is elevated from the Brooks membrane, okay? So there, uh, here, here we go. This is a branching, the, what we call a double layer sign, okay? So you have the RPE uh, sticking from above the, R the Brooks membrane, and here is the RPE elevated, and then you've got these two polyps right there, and here they are, okay? Here they are on an uh, angiogram with intraretinal fluid and subretinal fluid. These respond quite nicely to anti-abrasive therapy. Now this is an eye that has drusen, okay, uh, drusen all over, okay, the autosomal dominant, and here are the drusen, okay, right? So this is the ellipsoid zone, and this is the RPE intact, Brooks membrane, the RPE is above the Brooks membrane, and between the Brooks membrane and the RPE you've got stuff, you've got hyperreflective stuff. And here are tinier drusen, okay, tinier drusen, but then here you've got above the drusen you've got a little bit of deposits, right there, here too, here too, and here too. These are called the subretinal drusenoid deposits. So that's Brooks membrane right there. And here you've got the pseudodrusen or the, uh, that are above the RPE, which is subretinal drusenoid deposits, which are, give you a higher risk of getting CNV uh, than people who don't have it. Here they are, okay? Subretinal drusenoid deposits right there, okay? Here you have RPE and pigment epithelial and Brooks membrane, okay? The drusen is basically uh, above the Brooks membrane, and the deposit is under, while here the deposit is above, okay, above, that's pseudodrosin. And here this is, what is this? What is that? Hmm? Subretinal, yeah, it's a subretinal, uh, yeah, Ele the elevation is subretinal, and it's a little bit hyperreflective, so we actually call that a vitelliform lesion, okay? It's a vitelliform lesion because it's usually hyperreflective and yellowish. It looks like egg yolk, so we call this a vitelliform lesion. It doesn't necessarily mean it's vitelliform dystrophy, right? But it's a vitelliform lesion. So if you have chronic subretinal fluid, all that fluorophores from the photoreceptor outer segment does not get phagocyclosed by the RPE, and it tends to fluoresce and become become very you know hyperreflective and yellow. So that's a vitelliform lesion. So drusen are RPE elevations with moderately hyperreflective material, right? Well, a serous PED is an elevation of the RPE with hyporeflective material. So now you know the difference. Okay, so here you have uh, a patient with myopia. We know that there is myopia because of the you know, peripapillary atrophy and the, some changes here, but, but I'm asking, is this CNV? Okay, now there is atrophy. There is atrophy of the RPE and the outer retina that is very clearly visible you know, by this staining on the fluorescein angiogram. But the word, let's look, is there, is there C and V or not? Let's look at it together. What do you think? There's, well, the, there's, there's atrophy of the RPE. You cannot really see the Brooks membrane, yeah. right? There's atrophy of the RPE. Here the RPE is, is thicker, and here it is not, okay? And here on an autofluorescence, you can see this geographic atrophy shows very clearly on an autofluorescence because there is no RPE. Right? There's no RPE, there's no outer retina, so there's nothing that gives you fluorophores. So, in, but is there, is, there a, um, AM, is, there, is there a CNV? Mm -hmm. I, we don't see any CNV. Correct. Okay. So, another macular disease that we see very often is, what is that? VMT or 
no distortion, no pathology. VMA. VMA, yeah. VMA, yeah, the trimacular adhesion, which is the first stage of a, you know, a regular bona fide classic, you know, garden variety pigmented uh, posterior vitreous attachment. Right, so here you have the, the vitreous that is starting to elevate to a little bit of maybe cells or debris, and then here it is again, but you, is, there is no distortion and the patient is asymptomatic, we call that a VMA, all right? But here you have a little bit more distortion, okay? So this is pathologic, where you, have, where you start to have skittic changes in the retina, rips in the retina, cystoid changes. Uh, the, so this is called a VMT, vitromacular traction, okay? And that can cause metamorphosis. So the OCT is fantastic for you know, evaluating vitromacular tractions and VMAs. Now, this is the same eye. Okay, and this is the, the beauty of looking at every single slide of the OCT, every single cut. If you just look at the central one, this one here, you're going to tell me, oh, this is VMA. So? Yes. You're gonna, because it doesn't look too bad, right? But if you look at the slides above, you can tell me, oh, my goodness, there is a PVD, no worries. Right? Because the, above, above the fovea, the vitreous is detached. And a little bit next to it, the vitreous seems like it's stuck, but not really distorting anything. But if you go a little bit down, okay, from the, from the scan, up to down, you start to see what? You start to see that there's no, there is no vitreous detachment. Yes? Yeah. You can see that there's still, L is still attached, and it's attached and it's distorting, and it is causing a, basically a cystoid, a cystoid cavity, yes, in the retina. And if you go down, all the way down, you can, you can, the vitreous becomes attached again. So actually, the vitreous has detached itself from above the fovea and from under the fovea, but it's still stuck in the middle and it's pulling. And if you don't look at every single slide, you will miss it. Okay? Now, OCTs are fantastic also for evaluating epithelial membranes. It will show you the epithelial membrane. It will show you the amount of distortion. Okay? That... Uh, that exists and will guide you whether you know the, uh, the pathology is getting worse or not, or the, if the patient has had surgery, you can tell you also if the macular edema from the distortion has decreased or not. The epithelial membranes can, of course, you know, shrink the retina and bring the you know cause traction on the retina, bringing it either you know inwards or outwards, and therefore uh, or upwards, right? And it can give you what we call a pseudomacular hole. There is no loss of tissue, except that the, the tissues are, the epithelial mem membrane is bringing the edges of the retina together, creating what looks like a cleft. But this is a pseudomacular hole because there is no loss of tissue. And here is an inner lamellar hole. Okay? So uh, this is with an epithelial membrane that is associated with an inner lamellar hole. What is this? Is this a macular hole? Yes or no? It's a lamellar hole. It's an inner lamellar hole. The outer retina is intact. What is called? What is this called? The cleavus inversus. Exactly. So we've got an epithelial membrane that has caused traction forces, and we have an intact outer retina. So we have an inner lamellar hole. And what is this? Yeah, this is a full thickness of macular hole. Why is this? Why is this hyperreflective? Yes, exactly. Here the tissues, you know, block some of the light that's coming backwards, right? But here there is free entry. Okay, VIP entry. All right. So you have basically uh, hyperreflective. This is in all macular holes. Full thickness macular holes all have that. Okay. People who are debating what is this? What is this? Actually, this is just light. Okay. So what is this here? Again, yeah. This is again a full thickness macular hole. So both of them are full thickness macular hole in which the outer retina is not intact and the inner retina is not intact. Okay. So reverse shadowing. Here is that hole. This is uh, due to a laser injury. So stages of macular hole depend. Sometimes they're caused by tangential traction. Sometimes they're caused by anteroposterior traction, such as this. And here's that operculum of that hole. And here it is floating. But here it, it may start as, a, as an inner cyst, okay? then an outer cyst. And then the vitreous causes a little bit more traction, lifts off this flap. And this becomes an operculum and a full, full thing. And if you don't look at everyone, you will uh, sometimes miss a macular hole. Okay, here is an example. This is the same eye. The line was taken up here. All I was seeing was, you know, cystoid changes in the outer plexiform layer. Oh boy, maybe muscle macular edema. You go a little bit down, and you start to see that there is subretinal fluid. And you may still think that this is, you know, macular edema. But then when you go a little bit closer, and you look at another line scan, you can see that now you have a full thickness hole. 
So now, no, this is not macular edema. This is a surgical indication, right? Okay, so it's important to look at all scans, all scans. All right. Now, where is the fluid located? Where is the fluid located here? Here, this one. Hmm? Subretinal, yeah, subretinal. The retina is elevated. The fluid is in the subretinal space. And where is the fluid located here? Yeah, in the, in the outer plexiform. And here? Outer plexiform layer. And where is the fluid located here? In the inner nuclear layer. Yeah. So macular edema usually starts in the outer plexiform layer. Okay? And then when it becomes too much, it will migrate towards the inner nuclear layer, and then it will migrate towards the subretinal fluid, okay? But the fluid initially settles and collects in the outer plexiform layer, okay? Good. What is this? It's an outer nuclear, outer lamellar hole. This is an outer lamellar hole. Now, why is it caused by? Ah, it could be solar maculopathy, it could be a laser injury, it could be anything, right? But this is a disruption of the ellipsoid zone, right there. You can even see this in achromatopsia. So nothing, it's not always solar maculopathy. So this is an outer retinal disruption. This is an outer retinal hole, okay? So, uh, which side is temporal? Yes. Why is it reticle? Hmm? Because you can see the blood vessels and because the nerve fiber layer is of equal thickness, right? So? Yeah. Okay, I got you, but you got me. All right. So, what is this here? As again, it's an outer nuclear, it's an outer, mac, uh, outer, <laughs> outer lamellar hole, in outer macular hole. So, it's an outer retinal disruption in both cases, okay? And because you have disruption, you can get the shadowing, all right? So again, this is, was a laser injury. Okay, is this a vertical or a horizontal scan? Vertical. Right. vertical. And what about this one? Horizontal. horizontal. This is easy. Too easy. Equal. Now, you have equal nerve fiber layer thickness and here unequal. And the other thing is the blood vessels. Usually, you know, on a vertical scan going through the center, through the fovea, okay, you will see the blood vessels on either side. But if you have a horizontal scan going through the fovea, through the rough fade, you should not be seeing vessels, okay? Of course, when you go up and down, you start seeing vessels. Right, so what is this? Yeah, this could be anything, actually. But in this particular case, you have a structure right under the ILM, okay? And that shadows progressively. This is a hemorrhage, okay? This could be caused by a laser injury, could be caused by Valsalva you know, a rupture of a macroaneurysm, what have you. So this is basically a sub-internal limiting membrane hemorrhage. And what is this? Yeah. This is, again, a sub-retinal, a sub-ILM hemorrhage. Here is that, you know, ILM detached, and you've got the progressive shadowing. Here it is. This was after a major Valsalva in a, in a patient. And what did we do? We went and we did a YAG, you know, hylodotomy. This caused the, the, the hemorrhage to exit. And as it exited, you know, the ILM pocket kind of collapsed. And you've got that vitreous, uh, all the blood that went into the vitreous. Okay, so here it is after the, uh, after the ILM, um, after the um, hyaloid uh, YAG. All right. So, again, I showed you this before. Yes? I can go to the previous, uh, the top one. How can I know if there's any subretinal uh, hemorrhage uh, by the OST in the top one? It's very difficult if you have so much shadowing. You won't be able to. So what, uh, how can, uh, so it's will be top emergency for... Uh, yes, I agree with you. Very good question. Well, you can do two things. You can do, uh, you can do a, a B-scan ah. to see if there's any elevation of the retina. Or if it's very thick like this, okay, you can apply what we did ah. is, you know, a hyalodotomy, okay, early on to get the flu, to get the, you know, the blood to evacuate and then you, you know, assess. Okay, good question. Good. We showed you this before. This is an age-related coronal atrophy. This is what it looks like. You guys think it's myopia, but it's not myopia. Notice that there is no peripapillary obvious atrophy. Notice that there is no, you know, ge you know geographic uh, changes. 
So uh, what, what makes you think it's myopia is because you're seeing the choroidal vessels much clearer. So you think, oh, the ciliated fundus myopia. But actually, this is a patient with you know, age-related you know, choroidal atrophy, an older patient where, where the optic nerve is pale but not tilted, right? And you don't have these obvious geographic atrophies. And if you do the OCT, the OCT shows you the very thin choroid because it's atrophied. And because it's atrophied, all the major choroidal vessels are going to go towards the RPE. There, yeah, there they are. Okay, this is a choroidal vessel, and the, you know you can see the sclera right there. All right? So yes. How can we differentiate between this and albinism or like the Albinism? Yeah, or like the fundus. Yeah. The well, the albinism tend to people don't tend to have pale optic discs, mm -hmm. and albinisms have a different thing on on OCT. What do they have? Foveal hyperplasia, which is not the case. And they don't have thin choroid. Right? You see them, you see the choroidal vessels clearer because you have no screen, you have the RPE, it doesn't have much pigment. But if you do an OCT, the choroid has normal thickness. So? Yeah. Yes? Uh, how, uh, the here, is it, uh, Usually poor. poor. Usually poor, yeah. Not poor, like 2200, but you know, but you, you will not get 2020 vision here. And people have problems with dark adaptation. Yeah, usually it's older people. And these patients would have choroidal atrophy, they are more at risk of, you know, um, um, low tension glaucoma as well. Yeah, because choroid nourishes the optic nerve, and therefore they get, they get this, you know, atrophic, uh, vas you know, vascular. Limitation of the optic nerve, just like just like a patients with patients with glaucoma. Yeah. So uh, OCT also is very nice because it can detect changes in the posterior part of the retina. Here is a patient who has obvious myopia, okay, with a posterior staphyloma, but has what we call a dome-shaped maculopathy. Some eyes with myopia have a, a scleral thickening under the fovea, okay, behind the fovea that pushes everything forward. So their staphyloma is irregular. Okay, they don't have like a bulge in the back, but they have a bulge, and then it bulges forward, and then it comes down. Again, so this is what we call a dome-shaped macula. And, you know, pe people with myopia and dome-shaped macula, high myopia can, of course, get also intraretinal changes, schistic changes, and, and membranes. But the, here's an example of a dome-shaped ma ma uh, macula. Just recognize that there is, you know, quite a thin choroid. The retina seems intact, but the, the choroid is very thin, and the sclera is irregular. All right. Now, choroidal folds as well, you know, um, which could be idiopathic and could be, could be due to, you know, thyroid disease or, or even just high hyperopia, uh, will manifest, you know, with uh, these um, intervening lines. On a fluorescein angiogram, you can see the alternating hyper and hypo, uh, you know, fluorescent lines. And on an OCT, you will see the zigzag of the, you know, choroid and the RPE. But the retina is intact, except that everything follows, you know, they're, they're all and the, you know, they all follow the same direction, but the, in the inside of the retina is normal and the stratification of the retina is normal. All right, let's move on to retinal vascular diseases, okay? What are the hallmark of a retinal vascular disease? Delayed filling of the arteries and capillaries and veins, uh, capillary non-perfusions, uh, cut and wool spots, microaneurysms, microvascular abnormalities, telangiectasis, collateral vessels, intraretinal fluid, lipid, blood, and sometimes neovascularization. Here's an example of a patient who has all these, what are these? Microaneurysms, right. All these pinpoints are actually leaking in the later frame. So this is a patient with, you know, classic non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy with macular edema. Okay, and how does it look on an OCT? Well, OC, the macular edema can, can have so many forms. You know, there are not two macular edemas that look alike. So you can have here, like, just a very focal thickening Okay, usually, as I told you before, the thickness starts usually in the outer, the fluid starts in the outer plexiform layer. This patient has fluid, but also has what? Lipids. Lipid, probably, right? So he has hyperreflective material that is casting shadow, right? So this is most likely in the context of a diabetic retinopathy. It's probably not going to be pigment, it's probably just going to be lipid, lipoproteins. So it could be a focal edema with, a, with an intact fovea, but it could also be a cystoid edema with many more cysts in the outer plexiform layer, but then cysts that have gone further to, to invade the, even the nuclear layer, the inner nuclear layer, a little bit of, you know, hypo, 
hyperreflective material that casts shadow in the context of macular edema, most likely this is going to be lipid. So you can have cystoid changes. You can also have fluid that goes under the retina. As I told you, you can start, start with the outer plexiform and then the fluid becomes too much for the retina. So it's going to escape, okay? It's going to escape through the inner nuclear layer and but also to, towards the outer retina. And it can be associated with epiretinal membrane and with chronic fluid. Uh, you can start to lose the normal stratification of the retina. See how the retinal stratification is normal here. You can see the layers of the retina, the hyperreflective and hyporeflective layers. Here, everything is kind of mixed up. That's what we call drill, okay? This organization of the retinal inner layers, which is usually a sign of poor you know, visual outcome, even if you treat with anti vegf You may improve the vision, but it will never become normal again because the stratification is gone. All right, and also this patient has from the chronic fluid outer retinal atrophy. So retina is thickened, cystoid spaces, subretinal fluid, and uh, again epiretinal membranes and VMT. So all the you know with macular edema, regardless, and the OCT is not going to tell you whether this is a macular edema due to Irvine gas or due to uh, diabetes or due to vein occlusion. No, except if it's you have a vein occlusion that is sectoral. Okay, if you have, for instance, a branch retinal vein occlusion or a macular branch vein occlusion, then the changes. Uh, of, of macular edema are going to be in the sector of the of that pathology and not going to be all over the macula, and therefore you can say relatively calmly and you know with with confidence that well this looks like a vein occlusion rather than um, you know diabetic because diabetic changes tend to be a little bit more you know diffuse or at, at least not in a specific sector, but in a vein occlusion. Uh, not a central vein occlusion, but in a hemi-retinal or branch vein occlusion, the changes are going to be in the territory of that vein, and therefore sometimes the OCT shows you a perfectly normal retina on one side or one edge, and then abnormal changes elsewhere. Okay, but anyway, uh, all macular edema, regardless of the cause, macro aneurysms, uh, you know, uh, Irvine Gauss syndrome, uh, retinal, you know, venous obstructions, and and diabetic retinopathy, they will all give you. Uh, you know, similar changes uh, with a fluid in the outer retina, fluid in the inner nuclear layer, and lipid. So if you have lipid, all lipid is going to shadow. Okay, here it is, very clear. You have shadowing. If you have scarring, if you have like atrophic scars, laser scars, for instance, you're going to have disruptions of the outer retina and the RPE. Here's, you know, a laser scar right there. There, you see how it's, it dips, the RPE becomes thin. Here's another scar, and here it is. This scar right there, okay, and here's another scar, which is right there, and then another scar, which is right here, okay. So you can you can tell by looking at an OCT if the patient has a laser or not. Okay, retinal infarctions. If you have any type of retinal ischemia, such as a central retinal artery occlusion or a you know ophthalmic artery occlusion, or if you have a cotton wool spot, okay, or just an inner retinal ischemia, you're going to get hyperreflectivity of the inner retina. Okay, the outer retina is going to be okay, but you're not going to see the outer retina very well because of what? Because of shadowing. This is so hyperreflective, it, it doesn't let you see the outer retina. But this is not subretinal fluid, it's just shadowing. Okay, shadowing of this super, super hyperreflective area. So, initially, when, you, when somebody has a central retinal artery occlusion or, or an ischemic insult, whatever, even if it's tiny, like a cotton wool spot. It will initially, you know, become thick and hyperreflective. Not thick with filled with fluid, le thick and hyperreflective because of the axoplasmic stasis. And then what happens after, you know, a few weeks, the atrophy starts to set in, and maybe at, th you know, three to six months, you really have atrophy of the inner retina. Here it is, and here's an example of a central retinal artery occlusion with ciliary retinal artery sparing at the acute stage. Notice the whitening of the retina, which you all know. Okay, but this patient was lucky enough to have, you know, a ciliorethral artery that actually, you know, helped the uh, preserve the foveal structures. And if you do a fluorescein, uh, you do an OCT, you will see that there is this hyperreflective part right there, here. Okay, but then nasally, and you know that it's nasal because the hyper, the nerve fiber layer is thicker here than here, right? So you know that it's nasal. But nasally, the structure are intact are not hyperreflective. This is going right through this area. All right? So there may be field defects, but basically uh, the visual acuity may still be, you know, 20-20, even with massive field defects. 
Here's another patient who had a ciliaretinal artery sparing, ciliaretinal artery occlusion, you know, early on, but chronically, I want to show you that chronic stage, you see right there, here, which is this area here, above the area of preservation, you see that there is atrophy of the inner retina. If you go through the area that was preserved, okay, half of it, this part, half of it, intact retina, but then the temporal part is atrophic retina. And here, if you go down, okay, where the area was not preserved at all, you go, you go again in atrophy. So the, the OCT really tells you a lot of information. Okay, here's a patient with what? What does this look like? Branch retinal artery occlusion, same thing, with foveal sparing. Again, you know, with the OCT, you can see it with this top part, the top part is the hyperreflectivity all over. But as soon as you go down, okay, at the bottom here, you know, you don't see that. Okay? So, yeah. And here, what is this? What is that? This is a vein occlusion. Now, in vein, it's different, okay? In a venous occlusion, you get congestion, okay? The arteries are pour pouring fluid into the retina, pouring bl blood, and the veins are unable to, you know, channel the blood elsewhere, so you get a congestion at the con, right? So, basically, you have macular, what? Edema. edema. Yeah, you have edema. You have, you know, turgescence. Exactly. So here's a, here's a non-ischemic um, uh, branch vein occlusion. There it is. Okay, we can see that there's not a lot of ischemia, but there is a lot of fluid right there. Fluid, okay, going through, through the um, macula. And if you do a vertical scan, and you know that the vertical scan because the nerve fiber layer is equal, right? So, okay, and you know that if the arrow goes up, here we don't have an arrow on this picture, but if the arrow goes up, you know that this is stopped. So, here, basically, the bottom line, the, bo the bottom part of the line is normal, and the top part is abnormal because the vein occlusion happened in the superior territory. So you can have a sectoral distribution of thickness, and you have outer plexiform layer cysts. Now, in this same patient, as it came or went along, he started de developing more ischemic changes. Okay, it didn't resolve started getting more ischemic changes, and now what is happening, he's getting cotton wool spots, much more hemorrhages, this is the same patient, okay, and now you have much more hyperreflectivity, much more edema, okay, on always in that sector, because the inferior part is always normal, and if you go through the, the fovea, you're going to start to see, you know, the subretinal fluid, the massive intraretinal edema, and with time, chronically, what happened later on, then this patient developed atrophy. Okay, so intact retina, outer plexiform layer, and in a nuclear cyst, fluid, subretinal fluid, and then the thinner or inner retina with time. Okay, and here, uh, what do we have here? Yeah, we have a chronic ischemic uh, subretinal branch, uh, sub, sorry, the supratemporal branch of the vein occlusion with venous collaterals that have developed, but there is massive, massive macular edema. Here's another patient with. Uh, with non-ischemic CRVO, but, uh, but associated with a ciliaretinal artery occlusion. Now, this happens in about 10% of cases. Uh, ciliaretinal artery occlusion in association with CRVO. Okay, again, what do you see? Every time that you have an arterial occlusion, you have hyperreflectivity with back, with back shadowing. But when you have macular edema, you know, at other places, you, you have the... I mean, if it only was ciliaretinal artery occlusion, you will not see macular edema. You're only going to see the hyperreflectivity. But since now you have, you know, CRVO in associated with it, so you're going to have the macular edema. Again, the same thing. Uh, what are we seeing here? Okay, this is another vascular disease in which there is peripheral, uh, peripheral microvascular abnormalities, uh, irmas. Uh, there's asteroid hylosis, okay, in, in this uh, particular patient, and the patient, all these microvascular abnormalities are shedding lipid towards the fovea, and you can see that the lipid here, you know, is coming towards the fovea right there. The fovea is here, and temporal to the fovea, you've got all that lipid causing shadowing. And what this patient has was, you know, telangiectasia, okay, like a Coats disease, just a fovea telangiectasia with the peripheral, uh, with peripheral um, microvascular abnormalities. Here's... Um, yeah, this is a patient with juxtaphobia telangiectasia type 1, which is usually unilateral affecting males starting the age of 40. You have the telangiectatic vessels right here, okay, and they all leak in the late phases of the angiogram, and it behaves just like a simple macular edema with intraretinal fluid accumulations, okay, MACTEL. So you have thickness, okay. I don't know if you can see them, but they're 
probably around, around here. See, these are microvascular abnormalities. Now, these are nicely treated with anti-VEGF treatment, okay? Now, this is different from the gemsafovil telangiectasia type 2, which we call MECTEL2, which is an atrophic disease, called, you know, affecting the molar cells and the, and the vascular, the capillaries of the, um, of the fovea, okay? These don't have any thickness associated with them. They usually have, you know, intraretinal pigmentary deposits and, uh, uh, and the grayishness of the around the fovea. Okay, this is the telangiectasia. You've got veins that dip into them. Okay, um, and on an OCT, they're very very characteristic. You know, you don't have any thickness. You basically have uh, losses, uh, tissue losses. Okay, losses of the outer retina, particularly uh, sometimes even way out. Sometimes not just only here, you know, you can have losses of tissue oh, because it's a Muller cell disease, so it affects the Muller cells even outside the fovea. But in general, most of the pathology is seen right here. So we've got these cavitations, and you will be called an ILM drape. Sometimes no tissue at all, and just the ILM remaining, you know, that drapes the retina. Okay? So uh, this is very, very uh, characteristic. Notice there is no thickness of the retina, so this does not, this, is, this, this does not require anti of treatment, okay? Not every hole in the retina is macular edema uh, amenable to intravitreal anti of injections, okay? So here's another case in which the, there was a pigmentary deposits. This is stage four in this disease. Uh, you've got the telangiectasia, the, the, you know, leakage at the end, uh, at the uh, staining of these capillaries at the late phases of the angiogram. And again, the, an ILM drape losses, tissue loss, okay? Out of retina tissue loss, and in the retina tissue loss with an eye and brain, but no thickness. Uh, yeah, I showed you this, so forget this. Um, forget it. Okay, inflammatory changes. What do we see when we have inflammations in the retina on an OCT? Well, we see the, the you know, the sequela of an, of an inflammation. For instance, vitreous cells, all right? So vitreous cells, if they're very thick, they can also cast a little bit of shadow. All right, here this is a patient who has vasculitis and lots of vascular occlusions, occlusive vasculitis, okay? So you have optic nerve head leakage, which you don't really see on an OCT. This, you need a fluorescein angiogram for that, okay? But you have NVEs, and NVEs, you can see them on OCT. If you take an OCT peripherally and you do an OCT, you're gonna see structures that come out of the, uh, of the inner limiting membrane. So, uh, and, but you see the vitreous cells. But here, for instance, what, what do you think this patient has? What's going on here? DKH. Yeah, for yeah, DKH, exactly. So this is a patient who has all this big subretinal uh, fluid collections, uh, you know, and if you do a fluoros an OCT, you're going to see the fluid collection. And sometimes you see the splitting of the photoreceptor layer, which is what we call a basilary layer detachment. All right? So this is a BKH case, and here's a beautiful, beautiful case of, you know, subretinal pockets. Beautiful. Look at that. Subretinal pockets with some you know, changes possibly here, like a basilary layer detachment right there. All right, so here are the degenerative conditions. We're almost finished, guys. All right, so this is, what do you think this is? <laughs> I have it. <laughs> Stargardt disease. Okay, Stargardt disease, uh, very common. Uh, you have flex, okay, pisciform looking flex, and then you've got a peripapillary uh, preservation of the retina that is very clearly seen on autofluorescence. The flex hyper autofluoresce. And then as, they, as the RPE over them dies, they become hypofluorescent because there's no RPE. Hypoautofluorescent, sorry. So you've got a combination, a speckled combination of flex that are RPE cells that are still full of lipofission, and then other areas where you have atrophy of the RPE, pinpoint atrophic changes. And, in gen and then a lot of atrophy in the center of the macula, and this atrophy tends to increase, okay? So the OCT can really nicely show you this. It can show you here the peripapillary sparing. You see how the retina is spared right there, okay? And it shows you, see how the easy, the ellipsoid zone is really nicely preserved right there, okay? But as soon as you go centrally, you start to have atrophy with some deposits of remaining outer retina, okay? So atrophy. Here is an example of a progression of Stargardt disease. You can see these atrophic changes in 2005. A year later, they are much larger and they are coalescing. So it's really like a very continuous, sad a continuation of the atrophy. Again, here, the same thing. You've got peripapillary sparing. Here's the peripapillary sparing next to the retina. Next to the optic nerve, you can see the, the outer retina. But then from here to up to here, 
all this area here is actually atrophic. Okay? So both, send, you know, on a horizontal. See the little arrow? All right, here's the arrow. So it tells you that this is temporal. And here is an arrow. So which is up? Horn or horn? Right. Okay, this is up right there. Okay? And if you don't have an arrow, you can always like look very carefully and say, okay, how much this this area looks atrophic, and what is the distance from here to here, okay? And then what's the distance from here to here, right? And you can see that the distance is very tiny here, and it's much bigger here, so you can guess, make a educated guess. All right. Now, retinitis pigmentosa is a uh, you know the condition where you. Let you, you lose the peripheral field very early, but then you know the central central macular structure is relatively normal until a certain point, and then, then you start losing the cones and the and the macular structures as well. Usually, you have a hyperautofluorescent ring. This could be a small ring, a big ring. It depends, but usually the field is intact. The visual field is usually intact within the ring, and it is you know abolished outside the ring. And very often, the OCT will tell you where the ring stops and, and, you know, and how much the visual, how much the field is. Because here, for instance, you see that under the fovea, you still have intact outer retina, but here you have lost all the photoreceptors, okay? all the outer retina is lost. So the patient has a very tiny field that is restricted to the fovea. Okay? So here's another person you know with a cone dystrophy this time but there's an auto hyper autofluorescent ring right there and there's a lot of atrophy in the centrally okay you can see it on an autofluorescence this is the atrophy centrally and here is a lot of atrophy with shadowing okay there's no outer retina here it is not too bad it's not really normal but it's a little bit better than here here's complete white part of the outer retina within this area so there is absolutely a big big scotoma big scotoma in this in this area and even a, like a very deep scotoma here all right here's another uh, patient with a rod cone dystrophy initially started as uh, retinitis pigmentosa and then it developed started to have geographic atrophies in the central part and again you can see that this patient is basically blind all right with this, um, the OCT shows you that the, the immense destruction of the outer retina okay uh, here it is again yeah so lots of outer retina basically reverse shadowing, and how's the choroid, the choroid is thin. Now, best disease, okay, uh, is a macular dystrophy, which, in which you have fluid accumulating between the retina and the RPE. The fluid tends to be yellow because of the fluorophores that accumulate in it, and with time, the fluid, all that yellow material, that thick material tends to settle, giving you a pseudo-hypopion stage, and after that, it becomes, it starts to brittle and to be reabsorbed, giving you a vitel eruptive stage and then an atrophic or a fibrotic stage. So here's a case of a vitelliform dystrophy, best disease. This is, you know, what it would look, look like on a schematic uh, thing. This is an inverse pseudohypopion. Here it is. You know, you have hyperautofluorescence where the fluid accumulates, where the, where the fluorophores accumulate. And on the top part, you may have, you know, thin fluid. Uh, that doesn't uh, that doesn't um, you know pick up the, fl the fluorescence. So here it is on a this is an autofluorescence and this is a um, fluorescein angiogram and this uh, material blocks the fluorescein. So this is why you have the the dark appear the hypo hypofluorescent area, while the top part is isofluorescent. Okay. And on an OCT, the telephone lesions, as I showed you earlier on, always is the accumulation between the RPE and the neurosensory retina. It's not a, it's not a pigment field attachment. It's okay, fluid, like CSR, between neurosensory retina and the, uh, uh, what's it called, the uh, RPE. All right. So here is the vitelliform stage where you have, you know, reflective material. And of course, because it's hyperreflective, it's going to shadow. Here you have the pseudohypopion stage, okay? And it, what is, you see, pseudohypopion, you see, this is, this is a vertical or a horizontal scan? Vertical. This is a vertical scan, exactly. It's a vertical scan, so the bottom part has the hyperreflective material and the top part is the clear material. And this is a vitreal eruptive stage in which now most of the fluid is now transparent, but you've got the deposits all over, floating all over and sitting on the surface of the RPE. And then you've got the atrophic stage with an outer retinal tribulation, sometimes fibrosis. All right, autosomal recessive best disease. We have a lot of this in Saudi Arabia because we have a lot of recessive diseases. So it's, you've got these multifocal uh, best um, vitelliform lesions, but you also have subretinal fluid 
and schizis in the macula, okay? So uh, we're not gonna go very, this basically on the OCT, you have subretinal fluid, usually that affects most of the macula, shallow subretinal fluid in addition to schizis, in addition to fluid in the outer nuclear layer and sometimes even in the outer, in the outer plexiform. Uh, here, you can recognize this by these deposits all over and a very, very hyper autofluorescent um, you know, perimacular hyperautofluorescence. This is a patient who has this cartwheel appearance of the fovea. He, he also had a large peripheral schizis. This is a patient who has what? What do you think? X-linked. X-linked uh, retinal schizis, exactly. And notice that the fluid is not in the outer plexiform, right? The fluid is in the inner nuclear layer. Yeah? And notice that on a fluorescein angiogram, there's no leakage. So this is not macular edema, this is a retinal schizis, in a, a juvenile retinal schizis in a, in a young patient. And what is this? Hmm? Albinism. Is, well, you can also you know, argue with me that this could be choreoduremia, but if you see this, what is that? Hyperplasia. Foveal hyperplasia. There is no, no foveal pit, right? There is no uh, depression. There's no foveal depression here, so the fovea is poorly defined. So this is albinism foveal hypoplasia. And lastly, this is uh, what you know a choroidal tumor would look like. Okay. Now OCT is not best for choroids, right? We use ICG, we use B scan, A scan. But if you have if you have a, a swept source OCT, you can see the choroidal vessels very clearly. Yeah, the choroidal tumor is very clearly because it goes through the entire retina, right, and the choroid. But if you have just an enhanced depth imaging, you're only going to see part of the, of the tumor. But regardless, here is a patient who has a choroidal hemangioma. This hemangioma has leakage on a fluorescein angiogram, and then it kind of washes out. And on an OCT, you can see this elevation, this protrusion of this tumor, you know, onto, pushing onto the retina and causing uh, intraretinal fluid, right? Systoid changes and even subretinal fluid. So that's how it looks. Here's another patient of mine. Uh, we've done PDT several times on the span. Uh, here it is. There's the tumors, there's the leakage, and the OCT tells you exactly, you know, where the leakage stops. Basically, here, arrow, this is this part of the fluid. Here, there is no fluid, but if you go through the vertical scan with the arrow being up, here is the tumor. The tumor is right there, up. Okay? Arrow, right, up. Got it? Okay, with subretinal fluid. Um, this is a patient with, oh, what is this? Yeah, capillary hemangioblastomas. Yeah, this is a patient who has multiple, so he has both hippolindown disease, okay? And you can see the massive leakage of all these capillary hemangiomas. So yeah, this is VHL, and here they are. I've also treated this patient a lot, but, but what does this patient have? Leakage. Yeah, I know leakage, but what? What is that? Edema, Edema. right. So there's thickening, there's edema. So these uh, capillary hemangiomas are leaking and are leaking very close to the fovea. Okay, it's nasally it's fine, although he has a, you know, epipapillary hemangioma, unfortunately. But uh, cap these, you know, vessels are leaking towards the fovea. So there is outer plexiform fluid and inner plexiform and inner nuclear fluid. This is a, a combined hamartoma of the retinal pigment epithelium and retina. Okay, with the distortion of the vessels and the uh, you know, um, leakage inside, here it is. And on an OCT, sometimes all what you see is distortion. You really can't see much. Um, I think we're done. Perfect. Five o'clock. Questions? Questions?